Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Conversations in Spiritual Maturity. My name is Beth Graybill, and I'm on the Spiritual Maturity team here at Saddleback Church, and I'm joined by Rob Jacobs, who is our Spiritual Maturity Pastor here at Saddleback Church. And we just want to take a moment to welcome our in-person audience as well as our online audience. We have several campuses joining us as well as small groups in their homes. Um, so welcome to all of our campuses who are joining us, everyone who's joining us this evening. So Conversations in Spiritual Maturity really is a series that um, is being resurrected by our team here in this new season. And our hope is to provide discipleship conversations around topics um, regarding questions that we hear commonly. So a lot of times we hear what happens if we get stuck in our faith or how do we break through spiritual growth barriers. And so that's what we're talking about this evening. Yeah, so this uh, conversation of spiritual maturity tonight arose out of a conversation that Ken and I had, Ken Ba, who will be with us tonight, about breakthroughs. And what I was sharing with Ken was like, I was experiencing something in my life. And f frankly, here I am a pastor, here I am the pastor of spiritual maturity. And I'm experiencing a breakthrough. I'm going deeper in my faith with Christ. I'm going deeper than I ever had. And what I'd realized, it was because I was participating in a Celebrate Recovery 12-step uh, group. So I say that in all candor, as your pastor of spiritual maturity, I'm doing Celebrate Recovery. My name is Rob. And uh, so, but, and so I'm talking with Ken and he's like, yeah, of course, obstacles and barriers, they happen in our spiritual walk. The life abundant in Christ that we read about, going deeper, the fruit of the spirit, sometimes things get in the way of us pursuing that even deeper. And that thing, as I learned, was some undealt with emotions, some undealt with pain in my own life. And as I started to deal with those things, a breakthrough started to emerge. So uh, what we decided is, man, we've got to share this. And Ken's like, well, it just so happens I've done a doctorate in this. And I was like, wow, the Lord provides. So uh, we're stoked to have Ken with here tonight. tonight. We're going to jump in. You know, as I said, he's been thinking for many years around this topic and so he's going to help us walk through what it means to break through, what it means to push through these emotional barriers, these emotional obstacles to, reserve, to uh, resolve um, hurt or pain in our lives that are getting in the way of our discipleship and our growth and spiritual maturity. And so we're excited to start, um, and uh, let's jump in. Yeah, sounds good. We're actually going to hear from Ken for a little while, and then we're going to move into Q&A time between Ken and his lovely wife, Susan. And um, Pastor Rob, so we're excited for this evening. Thanks yeah, for so joining Yeah, so just us. before we go, Ken is our uh, working with our Campus Central support team here at Saddleback, and uh, he provides spiritual coaching and guidance to all of our 18 campus pastors, and uh, they're very blessed by it. Our church is blessed by it, and he and his wife Susan have been in ministry for well over 25 years, so we are excited to have this conversation in spiritual maturity tonight with Ken Baugh. I, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. I mean, this, <laughs> after all that. 1982, I started attending Saddleback Church. I was a sophomore at Mission High School. And one of the things that Pastor Rick instilled in us, even back then, was that your greatest ministry comes out of your greatest pain. And that is an essential understanding. The problem is, is that so often we tend to minimize or ignore or cover up our pain and don't allow God to actually work through it to bring about healing that enables us to connect with him and with others in more profound ways. So I'm hoping tonight that you will be better equipped to work through some of the reality that you've experienced in your life. Because the truth is, is that we have all experienced pain. That's like the common denominator for humanity. And what we tend to do is compare our pain with somebody else, and so we start to minimize it because, gosh, what I'm going through isn't nearly as bad as what they're going through over in Somalia or in Sudan or, you know, and so we tend to allow circumstances to, we hide actually from the reality of what we're going through. But our God is a God of light, and he wants us to live in the light. And so we're going to look at uh, a number of aspects of what that looks like tonight, what discipleship looks like, what, 
what it means to experience the abundant life. Here's what I believe. I believe that there is more abundance available to us in Christ, in this life, right here, right now, than we ever dreamed possible. We are the ones that tend to hold it back. God's love for us, God's presence with us is constant. But he won't force himself on us. And so he's given us the ability to actually uh, control the amount of himself and his love that we allow to come into our lives. And so when we recognize that and we start removing some of those things that have kept that, that barrier up, we start opening that gate. Then we start experiencing the, more of the fullness of his love for us. And then we're able to be conduits of that love to others. So that's kind of where we're going in a nutshell. Let me give you a little bit of background. About 10 years ago, I got a call from a man named Dr. Harold Sala. And I used to listen to him on the radio many, many years ago when I had an auto detailing business. I'd go around to all these, you know, back in the day, to all the realtors and all the off doctor's offices, and I had this little mobile auto detailing business. So it really gave me the opportunity to listen to, you know, K-Wave and KYMS. That was the big Christian station back then, so I'm definitely dating myself here. And so when he called, I was thrilled. Uh, I was the senior pastor of a church in Aliso Viejo at the time, and he said, Ken, I'd like to, uh, to take you out to lunch. So I thought, great, he's buying. That's always a good thing. <laughs> so we got to lunch and we sat down. And, you know, after our beginning pleasantries, he asked me a question. And that question was what has launched me into where I am today. It was a turning point for me. He said, Ken, do you think Jesus was serious when he said that we are to make disciples? Well, what do you think I said? I mean, I've been a pastor at that point for 25 years. I said, yes, right, of course. And so we talked about that. I'm not sure if he believed me. And when we finished our lunch and I was driving back to my office, I started asking myself some probing questions like, okay, so if, if, if it is true that you believe Jesus was serious, how is that being expressed in your ministry? Now, being the senior pastor of a large church at that time, I thought, well, if anyone can bring about change in that direction, I should be able to, to facilitate that. And so I started moving in that direction. Well, that ended up in uh, my going back to school. So I went on, got my doctorate at Talbot uh, in discipleship because I really wanted to make sure that I was understanding this. Well, what I discovered when I was going through this process and as I was writing my dissertation, as I was even growing in my own understanding of God and myself and all of these things and how all this stuff fits together, I really came face to face with, with what is transformation? What is it that God is transforming us into? Who is it that we are supposed to be? What is it that is available to us? What is God's part of that equation? And then what is my responsibility? How do I partner with God in, in this process? And that led me to a a very deep study and a three-year writing process where I developed a model for discipleship based on a robust biblical theology but infused with findings from psychology and neurology. And as I started looking at all these various facets of how God created us and the, the wonder and uh, just the mystery that is there in the, in the spiritual growth transformation process, I started discovering all of these different aspects. And some of that is what I want to share with you tonight. Now, I... I'm always loaded for bear, so you're going to get more than you paid for tonight, which was nothing, but you're still going to get more than you paid for. And Pastor Rick mentored me when I was a, a young pastor, so I'm primed and ready to rock and roll. I know that you looked at your outline and you're like, holy cow, there's six pages of notes here. That's nothing. I turned in 14. And Beth was so gracious to go through it like a hot knife through butter, and uh, by the time I got it back, this is what was left. So... Uh, Sometimes you need uh, unimpassioned eyes looking at your material so they can just cut, 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 because you just can't do it. So uh, some of the material that uh, I would love for you to have, I've posted to my website. Uh, so you have a link on your outlines. You can go there. I'll reference that later on in the evening. So there's four or five different uh, pieces of material that I think you might uh, might help you and you might enjoy looking at. And so for those of you online, uh, you can go and, and pick that up. Now, I know there's some watching online that aren't even at diff different campuses. So if you want an outline for tonight, I posted that on Facebook this morning so that you can go the, to the, the, the link there and download that. 
So as we begin, I want to I want to kind of start with the end in mind. So let's take a look at where we're actually going in this process called the Christian life. And it, it takes us to really what I believe is the purpose. We like that word purpose around here at Saddleback, so I thought I would start there. The purpose of the Christian life, I think, is pretty simple, but it is to become more like Jesus through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit combined with personal effort for the benefit of others and for the glory of God in this world. Now, that's a long definition, but what I want you to get is we are being transformed, conformed into the likeness of Christ. That's what God is doing. Now, there is tons of scripture that will help us unpack that. But let me just let, look at a couple of these for you. Uh, Romans 8.28 is a very you know, familiar verse to many of us, right? We're all very familiar with the fact that uh, we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose, right? Now, what I want you to notice is that purpose is singular. It's not plural. There is a purpose that God has. And you say, well, Ken, what is that purpose? Well, Paul goes on to tell us what it is. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. That is God's purpose for you and for me. The fundamental expectation in the New Testament is for you and me to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's, that's where we're going. That's the goal of the Christian life. That's through which all the circumstances and challenges and pain and good times, all of that, God is working through all of those things to bring about that single purpose to conform you and me into the image of Christ. Uh, you can go on. For it is God who works in you, Philippians 2.13, I love this verse, to will and to act according to his good purpose. Get this. God gives us everything we need. He gives us the will, the desire, right? And then he gives, us all, he gives us all the tools that we need. Peter actually tells us that everything that we need for a godly life, God has already supplied for us. All we have to do is access it. We have all these resources that are available to us. It's like a, a light switch on a wall. All this electrical power is to that switch, but you'll never access it until you do what? And, yeah, until you walk over and flip the switch, and then you're, you're connecting to that power source. We have a power source, friends, available to us that can bring about a different quality of life if we will just access it, if we will just flip the switch. And it, it, is, it comes out of this process of becoming more and more like Christ. You might jot down uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, another verse that we're being conformed into the likeness of his son with ever-increasing glory that Paul says, comes from the Father through the Spirit. So God is on this, this building program, if you will, of completing us in Christ. So when we, when we start talking about what that looks like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of characteristics that you could talk about in regard to God. What we're, when we're talking about being conformed into the, the image of Christ, what we're really looking at is being is being transformed into his character, not his nature. That's an important distinction. What is God's nature? God's nature are the, what theologians refer to as the non-communicable attributes. They're his omnis, right? His omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. Those are the, we're not being conformed into little gods. That's not, that's not biblical theology. We're being transformed into his character. If you want to think of that as the fruit of the Spirit, you would be spot on. It's interesting when you look at Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit in, in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Again, it's singular, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, he's not actually talking about nine different fruits. He's talking about one fruit, which is love, and then eight variations or expressions or aspects of that. Does that make sense? The one fruit, if you want to sum it all up, that we are being conformed into, the character trait is love. God is creating us more and more like him in his character, and you can sum up, one of the words you could sum up the character of God with 
is love. Now, God is other things, right? God is holy, he's righteous, he's just, but he is also love. The Bible says that God is light, so he's not limited to to that aspect of love, but everything that God does is an expression of love because God is a relational God. Everything he does is about relationship, everything. He exists in relationship. The Trinity is his small group, right? So if you're not in a small group, we're getting ready to go into our 40 days of prayer campaign, get in a small group. Why? Because that's part of how God wants to mold and shape you into his likeness because he does life in community. He does life in small group. We're going to talk a lot about group tonight and how important that is. So he's creating us into, into this, uh, this more loving person. And again, there's plenty of verses that we could take a look at. Of course, John 3.16, uh, we can start there. Fundamental verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So one of the aspects of God's love is giving. 1 John 4.8, God is love. And I want you to notice that it's not that he has love or that he does loving things. Of course, that's all true. But it emanates from the essence of who he is, that God is a loving God. Uh, It goes on, uh, Romans 2.20, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So love is the expression of God's character that he is forming us into. Does that make sense? I I think it's important that we lay that as a foundation because when you start talking about being conformed and transformed in his likeness and image, you're like, well, what does that even mean? What does that even look like? And so I think this helps give us some clarity about that. And so on your outline there, as as a Christian, you and I are in partnership. That's that blank there. We are in partnership with the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus in his character. And the essence of his character, the essence of this transformation that we are in the process of, of is, is love. And this partnership with the Holy Spirit doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, it happens through intentionality. It happens with our own effort. It happens through our participation. So in, in essence... We are in partnership with the Holy Spirit through personal effort. Now, let me just qualify that. When I say effort, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about doing something to earn your salvation because there is nothing to do to earn your salvation. Salvation is a gift. It's not something you can earn. And so when we're talking about this process of transformation, we're actually talking about a process that you and I participate in. That there are things that we need to do in order for that process to happen. And one of those things is we just need to open ourselves up more and more to the transforming work of the Spirit. Because very often, we are the ones that resist and hinder what God wants to do in us. And we'll talk about why we do that, because it causes a lot of these barriers that hinder us in our spiritual, in our spiritual development. So what does that look like? What is our our partnership, what does our effort look like? Again, lots of verses that we could take a look at, uh, but the idea is that we are growing in our capacity to, to, to love God. Romans 12, 2, Paul says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That, that's interesting. That phrase, be transformed, is actually a command. It's an imperative in the Greek. So it, it's not an option. And if it's a command, then there must be something that we do. And so there's this idea of partnership. There's this idea of us cooperating and working with. Look at Colossians 3, 1 to 2. Paul says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. It takes effort to set your mind on something. So this is one of the ways where spiritual disciplines become uh, a means, if you were, a catalyst to spiritual growth and development. Now, spiritual disciplines in and of themselves don't do anything. They're not, it's not a way to earn brownie points with God, and it, they don't actually do anything. But what they do is that they, 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 they help us create space for God to do what he's going to do. And it takes effort to do that. So, for example, uh, I think we would all agree that reading the Bible is a fundamental discipline in order for us to be conformed to the image of Christ, right? Well, if you never exert effort to actually sit down and open your Bible and read it, how can the Spirit of God use the Word to bring about transformation in your life? So you and I can't grow ourselves 
but what we can do is we can, there are things that we can do. So think of it like this. Think of it like, uh, like a farmer. A farmer can't make his crops grow, but he can plow the soil and water the seed and plant the seed and care for the seed and fertilize the seed and put pesticides on the seed. Hopefully, you know, not too much, right? But he has to do things in order for that crop to grow. What's the one thing that he can't do? He can't make it grow. All he can do is what he can do. Only God makes things grow. But spiritual disciplines and these habits and practices are things that, that we can do that God works through to bring about this transformation process. And it's essential to understand that if we're being transformed into this character of love, this, this more loving person, love always has to be experienced and expressed in the context of relationship. You can't, you can't give yourself what you can't give yourself what you need. You can't generate the love that you need in and of yourself. Think about all the one another commands in the New Testament. All the love one another commands. I mean, when you think about love over and over and over again, you see that it is the essence, it is the supreme virtue in the Christian life. Paul in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, of these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? Love. Is love. What's the great commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The, 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 the love commands in Scripture. Most of those, the word love is agape. That's God's supernatural love. We can't, you and I can't generate agape love. But what we can do is as we're receiving God's love, we can be then become conduits of that love to other people. So it's like what Peter talks about in, uh, in 1 Peter 4.10. He says that we are distributors of God's grace in its various forms. And so God works through us as the body of Christ. He works through us as individuals. As we are receiving his love, then we can pass that on. You can't give something that you haven't received. You can't give something that you don't have. So this aspect of love <clears throat> is, is so, it's so critically important. So you could say... There on your outline, what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ is this. It's to grow in my capacity to love God and others. It's to grow in my capacity to love God and others. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said that the great commandment was to love God. That it was the, the summation of, of all that we are being transformed into. Into more loving people. Now, i got to be honest with you. I'm not there yet. I mean, all I need to do is get in my car for like five minutes. <laughs> and my wife is saying, yes, dear. <laughs> to realize how unloving I can be. And so, what's going on in regard to this process of transformation? Because if God is doing this work, more often than not, I'm actually hindering it. So how do I stop doing that? Let's just take a look real quick. Let me just give you a, a couple things in, in looking at what love looks like. And there on your outline, uh, there's, we're going to fill in a bunch of, of uh, blanks here. So those of you that like doing that are going to have a great time. All right, so just leave the slide on the screen if you can for just a second. So this is all coming out of the great commandment. I think the great commandment is the great motivation for a great Christian life. That it's all about love. And so... To love God and others, you might write this down, is the mandate, the motivation, and the measure of the Christian life. It's the mandate, motivation, and measure of spiritual growth in Christ. Now you might wonder, well, what does it mean to love? What is, what, what is a good definition of love? Well, I think the best definition that I ever heard was love is looking out for the best interests of the other person. It's always other-oriented. And here's the thing, is that whenever you love somebody, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money. It's never going to be convenient. It's rarely going to fit into your schedule. It's always going to be about you making a sacrifice as an expression of love. So love is looking out for the best interests of others. Jesus put it very simply in John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. So love is action. Love isn't just sentiment, it's action. Love is, there's two aspects of love that I want to focus on. 
The first is that love is sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. And sacrificial love is a lot of things, but it's three specific things. First, it's unconditional. Number two, sacrificial love is unselfish. And number three, sacrificial love is forgiving. So when, when, you're, when you want to kind of get into the weeds of what it looks like to love, like God loves, and, and how he wants to conform us to love, this is what we're talking about. It's to, it's to learn to love people as we are, have been loved by Christ, which is unconditionally. It's being unselfish. It's being forgiving. Look there on your outline, John 13, 34. Jesus said to his disciples, a new command I give you, to love one another. Now you might say, well, wait a second, that's not new. How is that new, right? I mean, if you go back to the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, you know, the idea, that's where we get the great commandment, right? Hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what's new about it? Well, what's new is what Jesus goes on to say, as I have loved you, so you should love each other? Is that what it says? <laughs> if you want to, if it fits into your, if it's convenient, if it doesn't cost you anything, no. We are to love <clears throat> as we have been loved. And so, quite literally, it's laying down your life for the other person. That's the ultimate sacrifice. And so that's how Jesus has loved us. And so he's our example. He's our model. So love is sacrifice, but love is also submission. Now, you'll hear submission talked about in a lot of marriage conferences, and that's when, you know, the guys get all, yeah, 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 and the ladies are all, boo, right? <laughs> but everyone loves going to Ephesians <clears throat> 5 about, you know, wives respect your husbands and submit to your husbands and all of these things, and, and yet they miss this hinge verse here in Ephesians, or in Ephesians 5.21 where Paul says, submit, again, that's a command, to one another out of reverence for Christ. So submission is always a, a two-way two -way street. Submission is always reciprocal. How husbands show submission is by loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And how wives show their submission is respecting their husbands as they respect Christ. And it's interesting that husbands have to be commanded to love their wives and wives have to be commanded to respect their husbands. That's a whole nother talk, but it's just, it's just interesting. So again, Jesus is our example in regard to submission. Number one, Jesus devoted himself to doing the work of the Father. Number two, Jesus sought to please his Father in everything that he did. So Jesus devoted himself. He sought to please the Father. Three, he obeyed the Father. Obedience is always a part of what the Christian life looks like, but it always has to be motivated by love. Whenever obedience is motivated by legalism, by obligation, it's not, it's not the kind of obedience that we're talking about. We're talking about love, a desire that God gives us, right? Remember, he gives us the will to do all of this. And then number four, Jesus honored the Father. So these are just some very practical, specific ways that God is shaping us to love, to love others. But here's the reality right there at the bottom of your outline. Most believers are not experiencing the fullness of the Christian life. They're not, they're not experiencing this, this transformation. They're stuck. There's this gap between where they are and where they, they think they should be or where they hoped or wished they would be in their walk with Christ. They're frustrated in that. And a lot of times what I've discovered in, in just the many years of ministry in various places that I, that I have pastored is that something happens at about the 20-year mark in a person's uh, Christian life. Something happens that they just don't know how to deal with any longer. That all of the resources that they were uh, taught to utilize, prayer and Bible study and giving and sacrifice and service and you know, community and all of those great tools aren't helping them anymore. So the more they pray about this, it's not going away. You know, the more they're in, it's just they're, they're stuck and they don't know what to do. And so what happens is that very often they'll do a couple of things. Either they'll look around and think everybody else has got their act together, right, which everybody in this room knows we don't. That's why we're here. And so they think, well, it's just me. And so they just kind of hunker down. Or 
They blame somebody. They blame the pastor. They blame the church. They blame somebody that I'm not getting fed here or this church isn't meeting my needs and so I'm going to move on to another church thinking that that's what's going to be the solution. Or they just drop out altogether and they say, you know what? This whole Christianity thing just doesn't work. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. I mean, I've got the video, the DVD. I got the whole thing, the MP3. I got it all and it's not working. (laughs) And they just chuck it. Something is wrong. In 2004, uh, Willow Creek, which is a very influential church in Chicago, recognized that many of their core people were leaving the church. And they didn't understand why. And so they surveyed 11,000 of their members. And this has become a very famous study called the Reveal Study. And they, they developed these four categories where people identified kind of where they thought they were in their walk with Christ. Uh, It was exploring Christ, growing in Christ, close to Christ, or Christ-centered. So the close to Christ and Christ-centered were the most committed, mature believers. They were your 20-plus year believers. They were your children's ministry workers. They were your your tithers, the people that were supporting the ministry in every form and fashion. I mean, these are your Marines. These are the people that are making this thing work. And they were leaving. 52% of the 11,000 people they surveyed identified themselves in those last two categories of close to Christ and Christ-centered. But get this, 26% of their most mature believers of this group identified themselves as disillusioned and stuck in their faith. Another 27% identified that they were addicted to drugs and alcohol, pornography, that they were not really taking their life with Christ seriously. They weren't, they they were just spinning their wheels. They were stuck and they didn't know how to get out. And the the leaders of this study were, they were shocked when they found out all this, you know, it's like, don't ask the question, dude, if you don't want the answer. And so they got at both barrels. And I think it's very telling that the most mature people in a church hit a wall at some point where they get stuck. Now, since 2013, or as of 2013, 1,800 churches have taken the same survey and 450,000 people, and get this, that 26%, almost exactly the same. This is not a phenomenon that's unique to any one church. You You can't pin this on any one pastor not doing his job. This is a universal problem in North America. That we have a sanctification gap in our lives. That we have have some barriers that are holding us back from from this, this growing in Christ that is available to us. Something is very wrong. What in the world is happening? I mean, Jesus promised us, right? Jesus said that, uh, that he came to give us abundant life. John John 10 10. He said, I came that they might have life and have it, and have it abundantly. Um, yeah, John 7, 38, he said, whoever believes in me, streams of living water will flow from within him. John 15, 5, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And so you're thinking, well, where is this happening? Where is this abundant life? Where are these streams of living water? Where is this abundant fruit that I'm supposed to be experiencing? And why am I not experiencing that? So there must be something wrong with me. Well, if you're feeling that way, then you're in really good company. Because I believe that it happens to all of us at some point in our journey. We just hit this wall. We get get stuck. All right, so you want some good news now? We need some of that, right? Here's the good news. Every Christian, every one of you sitting here, every one of you at our campuses and are watching this, online, every Christian can experience more of the fullness of Christ, more abundance in this life, more fruit of the Spirit, the love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control than they ever thought possible. That is available to you. It's available to me. It's available to every believer. Why? Because God is the one that is doing this work. So if God is the one doing that, what's, what's wrong? Something is blocking it. 
Something is hindering this, this process. Your salvation is more than just going to heaven when you die. You know, so many of us, when we come to Christ, we're just like, okay, I prayed the prayer, and now I'm just going to try to do the best I can. I'm just going to hang on by my fingernails just so I don't mess this thing up, right? And so the idea is that, okay, Jesus, I'll see you when I get to heaven. But for now, I'm kind of on my own. I'm going to hunker down, and I'm just going to try not to mess this thing up. And they completely miss the reality that is available to them in Christ, this abundant life, this fruit, these streams of living water. It's available, friends, to us right now. It's not something that we have to get when we die. Now, of course, we're not going to have the very fullness uh, in this life of what's available to us, but there's so much more available to us right here, right now, than we ever dreamed possible before. I don't know about you, but that gets me fired up. That gives me some hope. So what is it then? I think there is a missing ingredient in the discipleship literature and programs in every church in America but Saddleback, okay? So we're just going to be real clear about that. <laughs> Actually, there, there's, there's a lot of truth to that because, I mean, I can't speak for every church, but I've been to, in a lot of churches. And Saddleback Church is one of the churches that take this transforming work very seriously. And we're very intentional about that. We're very deliberate about providing those resources and creating, creating that understanding and context so that you can, if you choose, can grow and mature in Christ in, in ways that seem Herculean. So what is that, what is that missing ingredient? Well, the, the research would seem to indicate, and this has been true for, uh, for my study here, I'm hitting the button, whoops, I'm hitting the wrong button, apparently. Okay, so let's keep going. I mean, we just had some good stuff just a couple minutes ago. That was awesome. All right, so the missing ingredient. You ready? It's emotionally healthy discipleship. The missing ingredient is emotional health. Friends, we have to stop talking about the Christian growth process as solely spiritual growth. We have to start talking about it as spiritual slash emotional. The emotional aspects are so huge. This is where the barriers are. See, what, what we've tended to do, and I'm not sure the origin of this, I mean, I have some, you know, some ideas about what it is, is that we have tended, especially as evangelicals, to limit our understanding of spiritual growth to knowledge and information. And so it, it's almost like we're treating that information equals transformation. Now, information is an essential part of that, but information in and of itself is insufficient. I mean, Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 6, he said, you think that by, by studying Torah or, or studying the scriptures, you gain eternal life. He said, but the scriptures testify about me, and I'm standing right in front of you, and you won't come to me to receive eternal life, right? That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It, it, it's not just about what we're doing in our head, friends. It's not just about this cognitive ex information exercise. And so if you limit yourself to that you're going to be missing a whole aspect of who God created you to be. Now, I don't have time to go into it tonight, but I believe we need a whole theology of emotion. And the quickest place to start is to recognize that God is an emotional being. If you doubt me, just go back and read the Old Testament. How he would say to Israel, you're like a, a harlot, that I'm, I'm your husband and you're my wife, that they were hurting God by how they were living their lives. The, the anger that God had in regard to, to sin and to uh, the things that were going on, not just in the nation of Israel, but in the surrounding nations. I mean, God is an emotional being. And so Genesis chapter 1 says that we're created in the image and likeness of God, and part of what that means is that we're relational beings, but we're also emotional beings. And yet we, don't, we have not brought emo the whole emotional context into our discipleship. You know, most churches look at, look at discipleship as programs. And they have a systematic process for that. That's totally fine. But what happens is that those churches that have recovery groups, 
it's almost like, well, the recovery group is for those people, and then you know the mainline process of growth and change happens in the discipleship programs. Yeah, that's not going to work. That's part of the problem. We got to bring our recovery back into this because here's the reality. Every one of us is messed up and dysfunctional. If you have a belly button, you have been affected <laughs> and infected with sin. If you don't have a belly button, I don't want to know about it because that's going to freak me out. <laughs> We're all broken and affected by sin. Anything else is just, it's just pure denial, friends, or delusional. We are all in recovery from something. And so until we bring back, we bring recovery into the core of our discipleship process, we're going to continue, in my opinion, to perpetuate the same thing. Because this is where we start resisting. This is where we start breaking down. Because this, this emotional process is, is so, it's so core. Now, I know that you have a lot of questions about that. We're going to get to some of those in a minute with Pastor Rob. But I want to walk you through a couple of two specific things, and then I want to give you a map that will start hopefully putting some of these pieces together. So if the missing ingredient is emotional health, there's two things that are catalytic for us to grow understanding that. The first one, I want you to write this down. The first one, and this is under... Uh, Roman numeral number six, is I must learn how to care for my heart. I must, I must learn how to care for my heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, to guard your heart, for from it come the wellsprings of life. Now, typically when we read that verse, we understand that to be to protect our heart, right? To keep the bad stuff out, to watch the kind of movies we watch and the kind of people we hang out with and all of those kind of things. But the, the, that word also means to cultivate, to care for. You and I are responsible to cultivate and care for and protect our hearts. Now, most of that's probably not new. But the heart is not what you think it is. The heart is not a muscle that just beats in, in your chest. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about your inner being. Now, let me just, just hold with me here for just a second. Because, um, well, I love this quote by Ted Decker. Uh, I think this gives us a picture of what's available to us. He says, according to Jesus, our journey through this life now is primarily to see who we truly are as the sons and daughter of a father who does not condemn us and who loves us far more than we can comprehend. We are his sons and daughters established in his likeness, flowing with more beauty and power than we have thought possible. As we align our perception, okay, I'm going to come back to that, of who we are, with our true identity, which I would suggest is our identity in Christ, we are filled with love, joy, and peace. Now, Ted is on to something here that I'm going to try to unpack for you and that we're going <clears> to <throat> go into some more detail uh, in our Q&A as well. But here's what I want you to see. We have to guard our hearts, and our heart is referring to our inner being. Now, this diagram is not in your outline. Actually, I didn't post this on my website, but I can... So, and I will, so if you want it, you can have it. But God created us essentially as a material being, which is our flesh, our skin, right? We get that. And our immaterial being, which is um, the essence of who we are. The word heart, there's four synonyms for, this, for our, this inner being. Heart, mind, and spirit. All four of those, inner being, heart, mind, and spirit, are referring essentially to the same thing. What is that? It's our inner being. Now you say, well, okay, well, what about the soul? Where does that fit in? This is, why, this is why it's so confusing, okay? So think of your soul as the bucket that holds your body and your, your material and your immaterial self, okay? So the soul always is composed of your material and immaterial self. When God created Adam, he breathed into him, and the text says he became a living soul. Not just a living body, a living soul. So it's this inner being that we're talking about here when we're talking about the heart, okay? Now, the heart is composed of three aspects, and this is true throughout Scripture. I'll walk you through a couple verses, but there is a plethora of them, trust me. Um, 
it is composed of thought, emotion, and will. Think of your will as desire. And thought and motion and will never act independently of each other. That's why they're gears. So they, when they turn, they influence the other. So here's how it works. What you think about affects how you feel. How you feel then affects your will, the choices you make, which ultimately play themselves out in your behavior. Right? So how I'm feeling, when I'm feeling something, thoughts and feelings neurologically are always connected. So when I'm feeling something, like if I'm feeling sad or depressed or anxious, there's always a thought attached to it. Now, you might not be aware of what that thought is, but I'm going to uh, teach you some things in a minute to help you do that. Because, oh, by the way, the brain can store three million years worth of data. That's how big the hard drive is in your head. Three million years worth of data. Now, you can't remember all that stuff or access all that stuff directly, right? But it's there. So in essence, the brain doesn't forget anything. It's all there in what neurologists call implicit memory. And your most conservative neurologist will tell you that 99% of what drives your behavior is stuff going on in your non-conscious or your implicit memory, stuff that you haven't thought about for years. That's why you can walk into a restaurant and smell an apple pie, and you can go back to grandma's house 30 years ago, that you hadn't thought about that in 20 years. But it happened instantaneously. Because that memory is there, it just needed a trigger. And this happens over and over and over again. Now, we've tried to watch the miniseries The Sinner. We've tried. Um, I just haven't been able to. It traumatizes me as, I, as, as we've watched it. But we did get halfway through the first session, and I already know now what's going on, right? Is that that was a trigger effect. And I can almost, even though I don't know the story, it hasn't completely unfolded yet, I will guarantee you they will find some things that contributed to that trigger effect and something happened on the beach where that was triggered and it affected her behavior. That's just how God created us to be, friends. It's really, it's not that complicated. So here's what I want you to get. Your inner being is composed of three elements, thought, emotion, and will. All three of those elements work together to influence behavior. Now, just a real quick, look, just look at a biblical substantiation for that. Um, the thought resides in your heart. Uh, Jeremiah 24, 7, God promised to give his people a heart to know. Here's something trippy. When you think, you're not doing it with your head, you're doing it with your heart. Okay, if you say so. Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in what? In your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, you will be saved. Look at this, for it is with your heart that you believe and it is with and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess it or save. So thought resides in the heart. Emotion also resides in the heart. Uh, Colossians 2.2, 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. So encouragement is an emotion, encouraged in heart, in their inner being, and united in love. Uh, your will uh, is, uh, is in your heart. Genesis 6, 5, God sent the flood to destroy the earth because the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in all the earth and that every intention and thought, not in his head, but the thought of what? Of his heart was evil continually. So his will, where he was making choices, this intention is in the heart, it's in the inner being. Ephesians 5, uh, or 6, 5 and 6, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. So sincerity is a choice that you make. It's, so I could go on and on about this, but thought, emotion, and will are the three elements of your heart. Now, why does that, why does that matter? And if you're an engineer, you're looking at those three gears and going, look, dude, I, I know you're a pastor and everything, but uh, three gears are not going to turn. They're going to get locked up. I've got friends who are engineers, and they were looking at my diagram, and they're like, this is not going to work. <laughs> and I'm just a pastor, right? So what did I have to do? I had to come up with a fourth gear. <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, all right, before I get to the fun, hold on one second. So hard in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for hard is lev and levav. It's used 858 times in the Old Testament. You can go look it up, all 858 if you'd like to. Just trust me. And in the New Testament, you're probably more familiar with this word. It's the word kardia. Both levav, 
Lev, Levav, and Cardia all refer to the same thing, our inner being. And all refer to those three elements, thought, emotion, and will. You've just never seen it before. But it's there. How, how, many, how many times, you know, sometimes people go, okay, whoa, 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 Jack, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I've never ever heard anything like this. Yeah, I mean, you're freaking me out. Have you ever bought a new car or a new used car? And so let's say now you buy this, this new white Honda Civic. And before you bought this new white Honda Civic, you'd never seen another white Honda Civic on the road. And now that you've bought this white Honda Civic, everybody has a white Honda Civic. Why didn't you ever recognize or realize that before? Because you weren't paying attention to it. It, just, it wasn't something that was important. That's stuff that's going on in your, in your non-conscious mind. Have you ever driven home the same way from work and you're pulling into your driveway or pulling up you know, to the street next to your apartment and you're just like, oh, how did I get here? <laughs> right, because you're on autopilot. I mean, a- as long as things were routine, your brain doesn't need to think out of the box. It's just, Ken's going to the house, bing. And then you can think about all kinds of things. I can think about, oh, Susan's going to be so excited when I get home. I mean, she's going to just be jumping up and down. It's going to be awesome. I mean, I just can't wait to get home, right? All the, I can be thinking about all these things. Because I don't have to. When you, when, you get to, when you learn to ride a bike, you don't have to learn to ride a bike every time you get on a bike. You've got the muscle memory. If you've ever learned to drive a stick, you don't need to learn how to drive a stick every time you get in the car. It, because the, the brain automizes things as quickly as it can. And so what's interesting is that all of this, all of this, uh, this thought, emotion, and will come together, and that fourth gear, that fourth gear is hurt. Here is, here is why this is so, you know, you're, you're going, oh, I get it now. When that hurt is turning, what's it affecting? My thought, my emotion, my will, ultimately my behavior. So if you think that you can go through life not dealing with your hurt and it's not going to affect you, wrong. We have got to bring all of this under the banner of our discipleship to Jesus because he is working with all of us, not just part of us. This is a holistic process. And when I say holistic, I mean that he's working with everything, how he created us. He created us this way, friends. I'm not making this stuff up. This is how he created us. Science just helps us identify these things. It doesn't tell us anything new. And the more science, you know, comes up with, uh, with information, it's like, oh, yeah, the Bible's been saying that for years. I was just reading this Harvard study. Harvard did this study on happiness. 1938, they started this study. 80-year study on happiness, trying to figure out what makes people happy. And you know what they discovered? Relationships. So, oh, yeah, I, I, I knew that. The Bible, that's, the Bible talks, that's all about it. God created us for connection. It wasn't good for man to be alone. He gave, us, you know, gave Adam and Eve. They created us for a relationship. It's not about money, status, IQ, health, anything else. They, they studied, uh, it was 278 sophomore Harvard students for 80 years. There's like 19 still living. And then they studied 1,300 of their sons and daughters, and they came up with the same conclusions. They even did a study on a bunch of people from the inner city and came up with the same conclusions. At the end of the day, it's about relationships. And the older you get, the more you realize that's true. I have never been at a person's bedside where they, where, and they're ready to die, where they have ever said to me, Ken, I wish I would have closed that last deal. Doggone it. I wish I would have caught all those seasons of Frasier. I just, I didn't get to... <laughs> What's their greatest regret? My family, my kids, my wife, my friends. It's about relationships. Well, why do we avoid those relationships? Ah, now we're getting into the good stuff. Because of this hurt. Now I'm going to start messing with you guys, so you're going to start getting a little more uncomfortable than you already are. I wish, I wish you guys that are watching this online were here because I want to see it in your eyes too. But here's, here's something interesting. Uh, there, on, uh, there on your outline, I've got a, on the bottom of page four, I've got this other diagram that just kind of illustrates what I said a few minutes ago that uh, 99.9, actually, you know, Dr. Carolyn Leaf is a Christian uh, n- neuroscientist, 
And she says 99.9%. I mean, to me, that seems like, okay, seriously? I'm going with 99. So anyway, so, but she's probably right and I'm not. Um, goes on in the non-conscious mind. And so there's so much hurt, friends, that we have experienced in life that we're just trying to convince ourselves doesn't matter. It happened 40 years ago. Seriously? Like, get over it. Why do I get, where is it in Scripture that we're supposed to go back and dredge all of this stuff up? I love that question. God is a God who says over and over again, remember. Remember, I'm the God who delivered you from Egypt. What did he tell the Israelites when they were crossing the Jordan River? Build a monument. Why? So that you can point to it when your kids ask you about coming into the land. You can say, God was faithful and he got us through this. Don't, don't think that God doesn't, isn't, uh, that going to your past is not important. Your, your past is your story. And your story matters. And the more we pretend that our story isn't our story, and the more we pretend that it doesn't matter, the more stuck we're going to be because you cannot move forward in denial. You cannot move forward. God wants us to live in the light, not in the darkness. And so all of this stuff is there. And it comes out in various thoughts and narratives we got going on in our head. It gets triggered by different things that happen in life that, you know, you have a disproportionate response to some situation and you're like, you know, and that other person's like, dude, what's wrong with you? And you're like, I don't know. It's like, where'd that come from? Well, something got triggered. And we just kind of blow it off. We don't even pay attention to what's going on. God's inviting us into this deeper place this deeper place of exploration, which takes me to number two, is I must partner with the Holy Spirit in the transformation of my heart. That means there's something that I need to do. All right, let me just take a few minutes here before Pastor Rob comes up, or a few minutes, like three, and I want to walk you through this next diagram. Now, I'm going to do it in pieces so that it doesn't feel overwhelming. Because by the time we get to the final slide, it's going to be it's way too much information. Now, you have a small one there on your outline. I have a full-size 8.5 by 11 one on my website. So if you want it, so you can actually read it. Because if you're like me, you, I mean, that's like font. I can't read it anymore. You know, so like, you know, Pastor Rick needs to go to like 0.14, not 0.8. Because I can't read it anymore. So, um, so let me just walk you through this real quick. We live in a broken world. We've already established that. We're all broken and infected with sin. Now, there's three kinds of sin. Now, this is, these are just classifications that, you know, are, are, are don't take it literally. Just, I'm just trying to formulate this, okay? We do know that we have original sin, that Adam and Eve passed on a sin nature to every human being. So we're born separated from God. We're born in this place of deprivation, <clears throat> in this place of scarcity. We're born broken. We're born alienated. We're born isolated. That's original sin that's why we need a savior, and we can't save ourselves. So, but then there's also personal sin, which is the sin that I have committed, and then there's victimizing sin, which are sins that have been committed against me, and there's varying degrees of victimizing sin. A bully is a victimizing sin. Sexual abuse is a victimizing sin. Murder is a victimizing sin. And so there's varying degrees of this, and it has different... Uh, consequences in regard to trauma that it produces. So what I want you to see, though, is that all of us are affected by sin. Original sin, personal sin, and victimizing sin. Now, what happens, what, this is interesting, what happens at the moment of salvation is that at the moment of salvation, your original sin has been taken care of. Jesus nailed that to the cross. So, you have a new nature now. You are a new creation in Christ. You're no longer, God no longer sees you as a sinner. There's a mind bender for you. He sees you now as a, sat a, a Satan. <laughs> he sees you as a saint who occasionally sins. But your identity now is that you are a saint. Over and over again, Paul, in, as he's writing his letters, he says, to the saints in Colossae, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Philippi. That's, that's who you are. The reality of your identity is established in Christ. And it's not something that is going to 
become more true about you. So right at this moment, you are a child of God. Right at this moment, you are a son or daughter of God, as much as you will ever be. Right at this moment, you are a partaker, Peter says, of the divine nature. Right at this moment, you are part of the beloved. Right at this moment, you are forgiven. There is no condemnation for you in Christ. Right, those are things that are true right here, right now. And those, are the, those same things are going to be true for you 10,000 years from now. And here's what's exciting, is that the more that I embrace the truth of who I am now in Christ, the more I will be able to live in accord with that. The more those things will become in alignment. And that's when spiritual breakthroughs start happening. When you start living and I start living out of the reality of who God says we are, not all of our distorted thinking, out of the truth about who he says, then we can start embracing the reality of who we are. Think, about it, think of it like this. All of us see reality through a glass dimly. So if this is the eyeball here, thank you. That was a fine art, thank you. We look through four primary lenses to determine what is reality, what is real, okay? And each one of these lenses is going to create a different perspective that is going to distort reality. What are these lenses? These lenses are family of origin, uh, society, or culture that I grew up in, uh, life experiences, especially painful life experiences. And if you grew up in the church, the church. Now there's others, of course, that have, that have shaped our hearts, if you will, but these are four big ones. And so when you're looking at what is true and you're looking through these lenses, you cannot tell me that you're going to be able to see clearly what is true. It's distorted. So that's why we need special revelation because God is outside of all of this. And so we trust in faith that what he says is true because he sees it all. He's not looking through all this distortion. <clears throat> he's, he's telling us now what is true. So when I start getting in alignment with what God says is true about me, i.e. my identity in Christ, then when God says... I'm a beloved daughter of God. That's my identity. All of the distortion, that might not feel very true for me, but when I start getting in alignment with what God says is true about me and start believing it, start living out of it, that's a game changer, friends. We are in a constant process of reforming all of these things. Be transformed by the renewing of your inner being by the renewing of your mind. Now, it includes your brain, includes your head, but it's what's going on in here. So here's what happens. Let's go back to this diagram. So we're all affected by sin, and what's interesting is that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, regardless of what kind of sin it is, whether it's original, personal, or victimizing, it creates death. Death in Scripture, now it depends on the context, but usually death in Scripture is referring to isolation, or alienation, or aloneness. And that is, for a human being, that's the worst thing that can happen. That's why solitary confinement is the worst form of punishment, because God created us to be relational beings. The worst form of punishment is to be in isolation. And so anything that creates that is going to be something that we fear greatly. So, so, so sin then brings death, separation, isolation, and the fruit of death is shame. Shame is probably the single, uh, shame is the, is the prodigy of sin. And all of the other negative derivatives that, come, that we experience in life, I believe, emanate with shame. Now, shame has two twin firstborns. And that is fear and blame. And the things that we are afraid of the most, I believe, I've got a number there for you, our four greatest fears are criticism, judgment, rejection, abandonment. And so the fear of those things is going to keep us 
in hiding. The, 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 the offset of blame, anger, grievances, hurt, choices, all of that. Now, what's interesting, if you go back, I don't have time to do it, but if you go back and read Genesis chapter uh, 2 and 3 and the account of the fall, this is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. It goes right back to that. It, it, it says in the text that before Adam and Eve sinned, they were naked and unashamed. Now, I believe that is literal, and I also believe it is symbolic. God created us to live real and raw with each other. He created us to live in complete intimacy and openness. That is, that is embedded in your DNA as a human being, whether you're a believer or not a believer. God created you in his likeness and his image, and part of what that means is you're a relational being. It's fundamental to who you are. And so uh, when, when we sin, shame emanates. The, what was the very first thing that happened when Adam and Eve sinned? They covered up, right? They, they pulled out those fig leaves and they, they hid themselves, not just from God, but from each other. So shame inherently causes us to turn away. It causes us to hide. It's a fundamental experience of, of not being enough. We'll get more into that in a, in a, in a couple of minutes in, in our conversation. But from shame then, shame then comes fear. Now I'm afraid that if I let you see who I truly am or, or let you know what's truly going on inside of me, that you're going to judge me, criticize me, reject me, or abandon me. And I ain't going there. So I'm going to hide. Okay, so now I'm in a place of hiding, which we've already seen relationally is the worst place I can be. So now I'm in isolation where, where I am fodder for the enemy because that's where he loves to hang out is in the darkness. And I'm most susceptible to his lies and deception when I'm alone. And when I'm believing all these negative narratives that are going on in my head from all these distortions and all of these life experiences. And so, so much of what hinders our growth in Christ, that so much that is, is a barrier for us, is just this shame that causes me to hide. And relationships is where life is. Because God created me as a relational being. So let's go on with our diagram. So, we have a choice. We can go one of two directions. So let's, let's take our, our choice to the right first. The right leads to death. Now, when, 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 uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually. Physical death didn't come until later, Genesis chapter 5. But they immediately died spiritually. So they were immediately isolated, experiencing shame. That's a big aspect of what spiritual death is. It's all about shame. And so what happens then is I wanted to live in secrecy. I want to pretend that it's not that bad. And that's where shame thrives. Shame thrives in secrecy. It thrives in the darkness. And what blows shame up, what dissolves shame more than anything else, is relationship. When you bring shame into the light, that which you're afraid will be rejected or abandoned or criticized or judged, when you bring that into relationship and you receive from that person love and grace and empathy and compassion, shame, shame has nowhere to go. It's like a gremlin. You throw water on it, it just starts to dissolve, or like the, the, you know, the witch in the Wizard of Oz. Shame only has power over us to the extent that we allow it to. The, the prison walls, going back to our, our, notice there's no lock on the door. The door friends, the door's closed from the inside. All, all you got to do is walk up to it and just push it, and it opens up. Fear, fear keeps us in hiding. The only thing that Satan has on you is that he's, uh, Peter says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's, he's toothless, though. All he can do is make a stinking lot of noise. Now, I haven't heard a lion roar in the wild. I have friends that have, and they say it's a terrifying experience. So I believe it. But that's all he can do. And when you, let him, when you let him win by giving into that fear and staying in that isolation, that's why we have to go there. That's why we have to work through things because fear is what's keeping us stuck. So, so going back to our diagram, so you've got this, <clears throat> you're, you're stuck in this prison of fear and self-protection and you think that if I stay here, I'm protecting myself from being hurt from these others to criticize, condemn, or judge me, but you're in a place of isolation, which is a place of death a place of hurt, deprivation, and scarcity, which is ultimately bondage. This is where most people live. Most Christians live here, tragically. 
They're just surviving at best. They're not thriving. And, and here's the deal, is that the choice is ours, right? Let's go to the other side now. Because now when we go over here, this is what's available to us, friends. Now we can go over here where there is truth and grace, where there is relationship with God and others, where that, that middle wheel now isn't hurt, but it's my identity in Christ. And the more I'm leaning into my identity in Christ, that's affecting how I think, that's affecting how I feel, that's affecting my will and choices, which ultimately is affecting my behavior. The only thing, the only aspect of your heart, your inner being that you have direct control over, long-term, is your thinking. That's why neuroscience is so important. You can choose what you think about. You do not have to be a slave to negative thoughts. And by the way, uh, I, you know, I'm sure I've been accused at times of being this kind of positive thinker person. Is there any negativity in heaven? There's only joy. Where do we get off that we're not supposed to be happy and joyful as followers of Christ? I mean, seriously, when you start embracing the truth about what it is, I mean, if heaven were all we got, that would certainly be enough, but it's like the sham wow guy. It's like, no, there's more. And, you know, you get, you get Jesus in here, and you get all this stuff, and it's like, wow. I mean, if anybody should be going out of their minds with hilarity and joy, it should be us. Back to our diagram. This is the place, friends, of healing and restoration and abundance, the place of freedom, the place of life. But here's the deal. You can't get there alone. You need relationships. You need community. Everything that you need to grow and to get through whatever barrier you're up against, the answer is relationship in some form or fashion. Because you need Jesus with skin on. You need someone who sits across from the table and they look at you and they give you empathy and love and compassion. They validate what you're saying. And when you share your story with them neurologically, when you share your story, when when, when it's shared and it's received and loved and valued, doesn't that mean they agree with everything? They're not condoning any sinful behavior that you might be doing to numb and cope with the pain. But when they give you that empathy, that, that never goes back in the same way it came out. It's forever changed. And so the more you share your story and and receive that from safe people and it goes back in, the more you're doing this, that is what's bringing healing. And there's a grieving process, yes. There's an embracing truth process, yes. There's all of this stuff. But the missing ingredient is emotional health. And emotional health happens in the context of relationships. And so when we start talking now about what spiritual growth and maturity look like, we have to talk about it as spiritual and emotional growth. Not just spiritual growth. Because we're bringing the reality and our need for recovery into our discipleship, into the core. It should be right in the dead center. Because we're all broken people. And until we do that, we're going to keep living with masks. We're going to keep pretending. We're going to stay in isolation. And any living thing that's in isolation will break down and die. It's just the law of entropy over and over and over again. So if you want to make a breakthrough, these are some of the pieces to that puzzle. Now, I have about a 10,000-piece puzzle for you, and I've given you like 100. And I'm sorry. (laughs) Beth wouldn't let me give you the 10,000 pieces. So I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a conversation. Now, it hasn't been much of a conversation yet. It's been more of a lecture, but Rob's going to come up, as well as my wife, uh, Susan, and we're going to have a conversation around some of these things and and try to work through some questions um, as we do that. All right? So why don't you guys come on up? (laughs) I need to get this real quick. Well, uh, this is the kind of uh, conversation where, and the kind of uh, things that get shared where I just think, man, I love this church. And I, I want to kind of frame the, the Q&A part with just sharing a little bit. Of, I, I shared a touch of my story before we started talking about Celebrate Recovery, but let me kind of frame a little bit about how we got here. Um, I'm a, pro- I'm, I'm a product of Saddleback. This is the first church that I ever went to, fell in love with Rick, fell in love with Kay, fell in love with this church. 
this church helped me move and grow, right? And, and so the things that Ken was talking about. So I took class 101 and 201 and 301 and 401. And then we have a retreat center and I'm doing retreats and I'm serving in ministry. And I grew from a baby Christian into someone who eventually, you know, finds himself as a pastor on staff here. I don't know what happened. Don't tell anybody. Let's not ask Rick. But, um, but here I am. And, but there was, there was a, a point in my life when my wife and I adopted our son from Korea, Robert, and I started having this tension in my life about not being a good father. Mm. And, I, and I was not sure where that was. And one time in um, one of our staff meetings, we have a staff member, Johnny Baker, the son of John Baker, the founder of Celebrate Your He's like, guys, we're going to do a staff group. If you're interested, come. Now, it's totally private, but I can say, because I'm in it, and I can say if I want to, I'm in it. So I'm in Celebrate Recovery. My name is Rob. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with fear and anger. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So w- w- what, I, what I found out was I'd sent, I'd sent tons of people to Celebrate Recovery uh, as a pastor. Like, I'll meet you at the door, but I've never gone in it. I'm like, you know what? God, and so God plays this trick on me. I'm like, I'm just going to go see what it's about, because I've told people to go to it, but I've never done it. And like one weekend, I'm like, oh, oh, so I have some stuff. I got some stuff. And so I'm able to see that I have some issues with fear and anger. I'm able to see abandonment in my background from my father abandoning my family. And I start to wrestle with these things. And I talk to Johnny and I talk to John and I'm like, do you guys know this is like one of the most powerful discipleship programs we have at Saddleback Church? (laughs) And then I talk with Ken and I read his thesis or the, you know, and I'm like, This is amazing. And what happened was, you hear so much about what Ken talked about right now, and I just want to encourage you to really pursue this idea of recovery because I would not have understood it to the depths I did if I wasn't already doing things in recovery, trying to work on my issues, trying to work on my hurts, my habits, my hang-ups. And so one of the things, what I love about Saddleback is we can say, not only can we help you grow in Christ, but recovery is available here. Yeah. Like we, can, we can do Celebrate Recovery for you. We can do support groups for you. We, maybe the most important discipleship step someone could take is to go into counseling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have Pastor Tommy Hilliker who oversees our counseling and all our support groups. Like those things are here for us at this church. And what a blessing. And what a blessing. But the question I, I have, Ken, as I'm listening to this and thinking about my own story is, How do we, or maybe how do we engage in this, um, Susan, as well? It's like, how do I find the hurt Hmm. and the pain in my life? Where where do I look? How do do I start that process? Well, I mean, you found it big time in in your life. How would you answer that question? The hurt and the pain? I would say life experience that you have on the diagram Mm -hmm. there really was uh, a major sacred wound for me and when I was 15 I was raped and I shut that down that I was not conscious it was repressed and so as I buried that I just it didn't come out till years later when I felt some safety actually it was probably when I first started attending Saddleback and started hearing about hurts and pain that I became aware there's something going on inside of me that is being stirred up that was unconscious, right? Right. And so God brought it to light, and I was afraid to go to people because, you know, the fear, the shame, and that's pretty much when I met Ken, and we started started this process of talking about hurts and... Mm -hmm. How much it affects our soul and our heart and our thinking. So, I mean, you can share a little well, and, bit about what you experienced. And it was playing out just in our marriage, right? In our intimacy. And, you know, my issues are abandonment. Hers were abuse. And so I'm chasing her around the house. She's running away trying to get away from me. And I'm, no, no, I need you to love me. I need you to love me. And but intimacy could be, a, that was a trigger for me. It was triggering something way in the past, like when you talked about earlier. So we began, it was hard for me, but being vulnerable, we began to discuss it. Yeah, and you know, that word, we need to talk more about that. That word vulnerability is, is the key to all of this because until we're willing 
And it's a catch-22 because it's like, okay, where do I find a safe person? Then I'll be vulnerable. But being vulnerable is the secret to all of this because nothing changes in that. And so, you know, we're married now. We've been married for 31 years. And Susan, um, that's worth clapping for, actually. I mean, seriously. And Susan going to talk a little bit more later about some of the things that she did that were very formative in her recovery. But I remember she heard John Townsend one day on the radio, and they had just written, or he just written this book, Hiding from Love. And I love the title from that. It's just mm. profound. Mm. And so, so she calls me, and this is when I was on staff here in Subbis back in the 90s, and she said, I got to see this guy. I'm like, honey, A, we're not going to get to see John Townsend. And even if we could, we can't afford it. <clears throat> she says, I don't care. I need to see this guy. But he put words to what I was feeling mm. and experiencing yes. in a way I, I didn't even have the words. So I'm thinking, OK, how am I going to do this? So I, I, would, you know, I went down to Pastor Rick's office, and I, that's when he was, I could, you know, and it's like, hey, uh, Rick, um, can you get a meeting with me and Susan and John Townsend? He said, sure. Makes a phone call. Bam, we're there. So. We're meeting with John, and that began <clears throat> a process with him. And you know, over the years, John's become a very good friend. And mm. um, but it was putting words to something that was in that non-conscious part of her. And again, we can't work on something if we're not aware of it. Right. And so I think God, in His grace, I think one of the things John taught me years ago is that Ken denial is your friend for a while, because God's not going to give you more than you can deal with. And so he, he will let it come when it needs to come. <clears throat> but when he does, you have to embrace it. And what, whatever he gives you, he'll give you a little bit more. It's, it's almost like growth, is that he'll give you a desire, but if you never act on that desire, he's not going to give you more desire. He's going to give you that desire. When you act on it, he'll give you more desire and more desire and more desire. And then it starts creating this synergistic process. Hmm. But a, a lot of times, honestly, I think, the, and it's not that profound, is it how do you find this pain? It, it Really, it finds you. And there's something, too, about making sure that we, you, you, you talked about effort, right? That discipleship, there is, we, you know, Dallas Willard, that famous line is, you know, God's, not a, God's opposed to earning, right. but he's not opposed to effort, right. right? So a lot of times I think we're, but we get lost, at least I did, I was putting my effort into hiding. Yes. Right? And what's the first question in the garden? You were talking about the garden. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Mm-hmm. Where are you? And God has came looking for them. That's the amazing thing is that God always initiates this. He comes looking for us. And so if we just step out from behind the tree, if we stop hiding or numbing, we haven't talked about that. Because a lot of times we'll numb that, we'll numb that pain. We'll, we'll, you know, pretend it's not there, it's not bothering us or whatever, or we'll numb it with alcohol or, I mean, addiction. And so we don't have to deal with it. And so, but it's all avoidance. And we're all, we, we go through this process of hiding in various ways, and God in his grace and love isn't going to come crash the door down on that. He's going to draw you out. He's going to woo you. He's going to, you know, give you things like this and, and, and examples of other people that you're going to go, okay, if they did it, maybe I can do it. Right. And if, if they have a problem, maybe I, and maybe it's okay if I admit that. And so that's one of the ways I think we get to help each other in all of this. Yes. I agree. You talk about the power of community, and certainly small groups plays a part of that. Um, one of the things about, say, like a Celebrate Recovery 12-step group is there is community in that. Um, but I think there's something so, and, and you talked about this, but there's something so freeing when you start to address the fact that you do have a hurt mm-hmm. and that you do have a pain. And to be able to say, that's why in every CR group we start with, you know, here's my thing. You know, I'm like, I, I, I am not defined by this. I'm defined by, you know, that I'm a, I'm a saint. Yes. Right? Um, I'm a saint who sins sometimes. But trying to find the place to where I, I'm okay with starting to talk about that, man, there's some power and some freedom in that. Um, so w- once we start to find the hurts, find the pain, um, how, do, how do we step into releasing it? Um, like what, what are the means and methods that you would kind of maybe talk to us about in terms of breaking through the barriers of of the hurt in our life? Like, you know, where where do we start? Yeah. Well, I think there's a number of things. The first thing, though, is just to embrace reality. You know, James 5.16 says to confess your sin one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. And the context of that is, is physical healing, but it's not limited to that. 
And what's interesting is that word confession. Usually we think of the word confession as a means of confessing something that we've done wrong. But confessing is also admitting what's been wrong that has been done to us. And so that whole aspect of bringing out of the darkness into the light, this is what is true about me. This is my story. And when I share that with you, as one in whom Christ dwells, as a conduit of God's grace to me, because you have the Spirit of God living within you as a believer, I think that's one of the beauties of that whole reality, that I can be a conduit of that grace to you. And so that's the beginning of that process, and just dealing with the reality. Now, reality is not fun. Hmm. And so I think we need, we need more grace than we're able to. We need like 10, 10 parts of grace for every part of truth. You know, John 1.14, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Not truth and grace. I think John put them in that order for a reason. Grace and truth. Why? Because we're not going to embrace the truth unless we have the grace. Unless we have that safe place. Mm. And what happens, and this is what happened with us, is that when she was in a safe place, then all of this stuff that had been buried and pushed down out of fear starts coming up. And then what do we want to do? Oh, no, you don't. And you, start, you, know, you just start shoving that thing back down again. And that's one of the ways that anger plays out. Because anger is very often a means of pushing down that, that stuff that's trying to percolate up. And so, because it's easier to feel angry than it is to feel sad. Mm. And sadness is an essential aspect of grieving. That's another very important part of the process. But you can't grieve alone. Again, John taught us years ago, if you grieve alone, you'll always grieve. That's why we so need each other. And when we stop pretending that we've got it all together and start embracing each other's brokenness and living out of the reality of that, again, it doesn't define us. I love how you, how you, how you put that. God defines us in our identity in Christ. That's what's true about us. All this other stuff is what we are working through and healing, and that's part of our growth process that we're moving out of. But that, that journey and that process also then enables us to connect with others who are in experiencing that same thing. Yeah, talk a little bit about, just let's, let's build on that a little bit, like the, the role of community for you guys in that. I yeah. mean, obviously you have each other, but um, you keep talk, referring to people that are, were significant in your lives in, in terms of walking down this road toward re, you know, break, the breakthrough. Um, what does that look like for you guys? Yeah. Well, I mean, we are deeply embedded in community. I mean, like half of the group here is our community. So, I mean, I kind of stacked the deck tonight because I was really uh, <laughs> afraid. But anyways, um, there's so many people here and there's many that are watching online that, that couldn't be with us tonight that are, that are part of that. I mean, it's like our family. We couldn't make it without. It's a place of vulnerability and safety and we really go through all of these elements of sharing the hurts and the pain, and really, uh, with scripture, realigning who God says we are. And, and, re and affirming that for each other. Being living reminders. Um, so much of my thinking was so defeated in my shame that I wasn't worthy. I wasn't good enough. And yet, when I began to see through God's lens of who he says I am, that I'm his beloved, that he delights in me. And as I'm experiencing that with others in the groups, it's like it began to seep in. Yeah. And that's where the freedom of being able to share more of the pain and the yeah. hurt. Yeah, and you, and you referenced the power of like saying being in a small group. I, I can think back in my own story of my wife and I struggle with infertility and we started, you know, we go to the first night of this group and who do we meet is someone who has struggled with infertility. Yeah. And that shared pain to be able to not hide it, but to say, oh, you too? Yeah. Yes. You know, um, and to be able to, to, to move forward in that. So you, you talked about the power of reality um, and the need for us to do the best that we can to see in reality. But what, what if I'm afraid? What yeah. if I'm afraid to see? What if I don't want to see reality? Welcome uh, to the human race. Because <laughs> we all are afraid. Because, but here's the lie, though. Is the lie that is it, you know, the lie is, don't you open that can of worms. Don't, don't even go there. Because the second you go there, 
The second you share that with Rod, he's going to reject you. He's going to make fun of you. He's going to say, dude, that happened 40 years ago. Suck it up. Be a man. Come on. Stop being such a baby. And what that does is that just pushes it down even further, and we, 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 hide, mm -hmm. we hide more. So the, the ability to actually walk in the light of this, it's, it's scary. It, frankly, it takes a lot of courage. And so you have to find those places where you have examples of people that are doing it and have done it, and you see the benefits, and you see, well, they survived it, so then I can survive. Mm -hmm. And for goodness sakes, if pastors are going through this, I mean, I've, I've, I've been a follower of Christ for 40 years. It's a long time. And I'm still struggling with stuff, but I'm on the road to recovery. I'm on the, the healing journey and the process. And I've made progress, and there's days where I'm like, really? That doesn't seem like you made a lot of progress. And that's a great place for me to go back to this, oh, well, yeah, I guess I'm just a scumbag. And, and then Satan's all that deception, all those accusations and all those lies, and he's the father of lies, and he's a murderer, and that's what he does. And so when we succumb to that and let him win with fear, it's just, it's tragic. Yeah. So then what was like that for you to finally say, okay, I have to start to go there. I have to go there on, on you know, the, the things in your, in your background that were so painful. What was that like for you to finally? It was, it was scary. It really was. I stepping out and really reaching out to a few friends that would meet regularly with me and hear my heart and, and me hear their heart was, that was transforming. Um, life-changing and actually we began in the beginning memorizing scripture together some passages that really began to as we're memorizing thinking am I really living that mm -hmm. you know and and getting to the walls of what was blocking that and that was powerful I that's a great tool you were talking about spiritual habit memorizing scripture passages yeah, I mean, scripture's like a battering ram on, on the door. It's just, you know, and over time, it just breaks it through. I mean, Susan memorized the entire book of Ephesians, hmm. the whole thing, all six chapters. And she, it took her a couple years to do it. I mean, we had note cards everywhere, like all of them, every mirror in the car. I mean, it's just like <laughs> bundles next to the bed. I mean, you know, it's just everywhere. But I watched, I, I, I mean, she had done a lot of work years before that, just it's been this continual process. But honestly, and maybe it was just the right timing for all of that, but I watched scripture transform her thinking. And then all of this stuff that we're talking about here was just, I mean, I'm telling you, this works. And Ephesians is such a great place to start because, you know, half of it is theology and the other half is application and it's so focused on our identity in Christ and when you start coming into alignment with what God says is true about you and believing that in faith even when you don't think it's true because you've got all these narratives going on in your head but once you start this is what's really interesting neurologically is that what you pay attention to starts to, to, to change your thinking and what you what you don't pay attention to starts to dissipate so there's this really interesting experiment this uh, this neuroscientist had a group of college students, and he said, uh, he said, okay, he took, he took the testing group, and he said, I'm going to teach you a one-handed piano sequence, and I want you to practice the sequence for two weeks. And he did a brain scan on them before, before the exam, and a brain scan after. After two weeks, the brain, the, the brain scan revealed that there was new gray matter, new neurons that had grown in that area of the brain, because they mapped the brain so that wherever you move your fingers or whatever, it lights up different parts of your brain. So they've mapped the brain as to where that kind of stuff emanates. <clears throat> so they had this new gray matter. Then he said, okay, cut that group in half. He said, now, half of you I want you to not practice for two weeks. The other half of you I want you to keep practicing for two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, he did brain scans again. The group that stopped practicing, all that gray matter that had formed before was gone. Hmm. And the gray matter in the new students that continued grew. That's not the best part. I'm going to start doing sham wow commercials. <laughs> so then he said... <laughs> Then he took that group and he divided it in half. He said, okay, now I want half of you to not, to just for, for half an hour every day, just like you were doing before, I want you to just close your eyes. I don't want you to move anything. I just want you to visualize playing the piano, that doing that sequence. I just want you to visualize it. 
He said, the other half of the group, I want you to practice for another two weeks like you're doing. Brain scans at the end of that two weeks, right? Now, the, sorry, the testing group that did the, uh, the, uh, the imagination part were the, were the ones that had lost everything from the other ones, right? Okay, so tested them after that, and the ones that had not done anything and just did this, guess what? All that gray matter came back. Mm -hmm. And the group that actually were doing it, more gray matter was formed. So the point is this, is that what you pay attention to matters. That's why Jesus said, don't worry. Because when you're focusing on all the negative stuff, you're just rehearsing, you're just building more and more gray matter. It's creating this frenzy. And you just get into this negative routine, and it's just, it's like code. It, you, you start the code here, and it just, it just keeps going. Right. So when you are transforming your mind by, with Scripture, with what God says is true, that's why this identity in Christ stuff is life-changing. That and stop thinking about this other stuff because you can choose not to think about it. Mm. Then that starts dissipating and dissolving and the truth of who you, God says you are starts to grow and get stronger and stronger and then you start actually believing it and then that starts actually affecting your choices and then your emotions <clears throat> and then your behavior and voila, now you become the kind of person that doesn't even desire to do the things that you used to do before. Yes, and you're found, right? God starts to mm -hmm. find you. That's where you, you, you come out from. I always think of like, Shame is like, you know, Adam and Eve, they're hiding behind the bushes, right? You yeah. know? Like God doesn't know where they are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, shame. Um, it's obviously a powerful part in this. Um, it's something that we're, we're struggling with. What does shame look like uh, in kind of our everyday lives? I know there's the, mm. there's the big shames of like, you know, I cheated on my wife or the, those, but what are... What's the, what's the kind of everyday little things that we don't, may not be aware that we're doing that really kind of point to, I'm ashamed. I'm, I want to hide. Mm. Mm. What would you say to that? We were talking about that earlier today. Mm -hmm. what, what were you sharing? So, Brene Brown is like, she's like a shame and vulnerability expert. And mm -hmm. even though she writes for more of a popular audience, I mean, she's a, she's a solid uh, um, researcher, I'm not belittling that at all, but she's been able to put it into um, a vocabulary so that other people can understand it. So she defines shame as this profound sense of I'm not enough. So whatever you would fill the blank in, I'm not blank enough is shame. I'm not smart enough, thin enough, successful enough, rich enough, whatever it is, that's shame. And so it's this profound sense of unworthiness, that I'm not worthy of being loved. And, uh, and so it creates this sense of fear that, I, I, that if I let you know who I really am, then you're going to reject me, so I'm not going to go there. I'm going to put this mask on, and the mask is just creating something that I know that you're going to affirm. But the thing is, is that when you have a mask on, you're not getting the love that's coming in. Your mask is getting it. You have to remove the mask in order for the love to come through, and that requires vulnerability. And, and that's terrifying. For men, vulnerability is equated with weakness, and so, which is like, like death on steroids for, for a man, right? What's the, the greatest fear a boy has you know, when he's in junior high or high school? It's being called a, a wussy, right? Being a, being a weak. And so our culture just reinforces this suck it up, be a man, you know, don't let anything hurt you, don't let them see a flinch, and, and all of that. That's not biblical. And what it does is it actually makes it worse because God created us how he created us. And if we, we violate this, if we do it to our own peril. Yeah. So shame is this, and I, I really think shame, <clears throat> um, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt Thompson is a, a psychiatrist. He specializes in neuroscience. He's a believer. He teaches up at, at Talbot periodically. Brilliant guy. Uh, has written a couple of really helpful books. One's called The Anatomy of the Soul. Mm -hmm. The other one's called The Soul of Shame. And he actually says, and I think he makes a pretty strong case for it, that shame is really the personification or the greatest expression of evil in our world. And you think of all the things that are done in our world, if you think of it that shame is what's driving that, it starts making a lot of sense. Mm. And it's Satan's go-to weapon in spiritual warfare. Accusations. You're not good enough. Yes. Rob, you're a pastor and you're in recovery? Yeah. Seriously? <clears throat> it plays on the, the temptation back in the garden, right? To like, hey, let's be God. So instead of yep. the temptation, instead of 
pursuing the life of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit and even the way of weakness that comes with that, we go back to those omnis. I can control it. I'm, om- I'm omnipowerful. You know, I'm omnipresent. I can be everywhere. I'm omnicompetent. I can do anything. The society keeps telling us, you have to be all these omnis. Yep. Right? And so we get ashamed if we can't, you know, we can't do those things. And then we just get into that cycle, right? Yeah. We just, that shame cycle. So you, we talk a lot about the, the thoughts we're putting in our head, but I, I, like, I think about Paul, like he's like, there's the things I want to do. Yeah, Romans right? 7. So yeah. in some ways you could say, well, there's the thoughts I want to think, but I think the thoughts I don't want to think. Like, how do we, how do we handle that? Where, where do we go with that? Yeah. Well, one of the ways you did that was memorizing scripture and just taking those thoughts captive. Well, yeah, what is that, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 5, 10, yeah. take every thought captive to Christ. <clears throat> every. And we do, we, I think we just read over that sometimes, but that's huge. And, and I really did begin a process of being intentional as I went through kind of a 90-day program of journaling my thoughts, journaling my struggles, and taking those in alignment with scripture said, not the shameful thoughts I was feeling. And it's amazing that process with scripture and prayer daily, how it began to renew my mind, my heart, my inner being, as we've been learning tonight. So what Paul says, <clears throat> I, wanted, I wanted to read the verse four too, this is 2 Corinthians 10. He says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And I think a stronghold can be a negative thought that we are just steeped in and stuck in. So we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Mm. Now, what does that mean? I think... <clears throat> I think Largely, it means that when I have a thought, a negative thought, a destructive thought, a distorted thought, and I am aware of it because I'm paying attention, and I take that thought now and compare it to what God says is true about me, then I defer to what God says is true and recognize this thought as a lie from the enemy. Why do I want to hold on to that? Fear is never of God. Fear is always of Satan. Mm. And so when I, start, when I start training myself, I think this is the key. I start training myself to pay attention to what I'm actually thinking about. Most people just aren't paying attention. You know, Kurt Thompson says we need to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. Right. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> and so when we, when we realize, wow, I'm having this, I'm feeling angry right now. And when you've, when you've trained yourself to go, time out. What's going on? That, was a, that, that, was, that, was, that reaction was way disproportional to the situation. I can recognize that now because I'm training myself to be, become aware of that, and now I can start asking myself some probing questions. What are you thinking right now? What's going on? Because your emotions are connected to your thoughts. So every emotion that you're having somehow is connected to a thought. And the more you start exploring that, the more that those will start revealing themselves. That's why I think silence and solitude is such an essential discipline for, this, for the growth process. You know, it's David in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. You know, it's this whole idea of being quiet before the Lord. And if there's stuff there that needs to be, that needs to be exposed and dealt with, and you're inviting the <laughs> Spirit to reveal that, then he's, he will. Yeah. But if you don't invite him to do that, he's not. He's not going to kick the door down. Right. But, so when we think about um, maturity at Saddleback, we like to think about this idea of heart, soul, mind, strength. It's a great commandment. And, and one of the things, and we have, obviously we're blessed with a retreat center, but just this idea of um, that we can open our, ourselves to God um, through, you know, we're listening, but, but pursuing practices like silence and solitude that can help, help us get there. Drill down on that a little more, that, that Psalm 139, that, you know, opening ourselves kind of, you know, that discipline, you know, because I'm thinking one of the things I do, there's an, an ancient Ignatian uh, practice called the examine. And it's just a prayer. It's just a way to think about your end of your day. Just how did I do? You know, so it's not like some mystic thing. But it's just, you know, some questions I ask myself. Like, did I, you know, how was I lo- loving? Where was I messing up? And just kind of a daily thinking through. But what, I, what I'm doing is searching my heart. Talk about just kind of that 
that practice or that discipline that as something that can help us, you know, dig into some of this stuff. Yeah, well, there's no one that does it as intentionally that I, think that I know than you. I mean, that whole examine thing is something that you lean, have leaned into heavily, mm -hmm. taking those thoughts, writing them down. Well, even <clears> you mentioned <throat> the examine, there's also Lectio. And you're taking, as I'm memorizing scripture, small passages and just meditating on it, reading it, reading it. What is the invitation here? Reading it again, sitting in silence and solitude with it. You know, it's so reflective in what is God saying to me? What does this mean? What must I do? You know, there's the effort of engaging with the Holy Spirit, partnering with. Yeah. There's something uh, so powerful about just spending that time in silence and solitude. And even for myself last <laughs> night, I'm thinking, yeah, it just reminded me, I had kind of a breakthrough in an area of shame that I remembered going all the way back to fourth grade. Now, you might hear that and say, I'm I don't want that. I'm afraid of that. But for me to have God bring that to mind, for that to come up, it's freeing because mm -hmm. I don't have to. I'm not in fourth grade <laughs> anymore. Yeah. I don't have to carry that shame anymore, right? And your saddleback is a second uh, chance grace place. But you know what? We're almost, we're the set down your shame place, right? This, you have leaders in Rick and Kate who are so open about the struggles they've had um, and we have people like John Baker or, or, or Danny Duchesne, who, these people who are open about the struggles that they've had in this life. And we say, this is the place to be. This is the place to be. Well, um, and not only are they open to that, Rob, I mean, we've known Rick and Kay for 36, seven years. And not only are they open to that, they're open to it's okay that you're not okay. Yeah. And so it's not that you have to put on this pretense to either even be on staff here, that you can be a real person and have real struggles. <clears throat> and we will work with you. We will help you. We will get you the help you need. But uh, because there's no pretense that, that anybody's got it together. And they would be the first to say that to you. Yeah. I mean, you know, Kay's yeah. message last weekend was yeah, just exactly. such a great illustration per of that. Perfect point of that. And Rick always says, you know, I, I don't like to hire people unless they have a hurt in their life, you know. Um, so... We're talking about our church. We're talking about this place we love. Um, we're talking about the people here. So how do we, uh, maybe just a, a few tips or suggestions, how do we find the safe people in our lives? I mean, uh, how, you know, what does that look like? To, what advice would you give? And you just to find that person that you can start to open up to, that you can come from behind the bushes and say, I'm here, you know, I'm found uh, to be known. Well, one of the things you said, even as we were driving over here this afternoon, you said... I'm finding that the more safe that I'm becoming to the people that I'm in community with, the more I'm finding that in them. So that's been part of your experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and when we meet someone, we may have a similar life experience hurt, that we begin to connect our hearts and share and become safe for one another. I mean, honestly, I had to read Safe People to really learn what is it to be a safe person. Yeah. By, um, yeah, the Townsend Cloud book. It was just <clears throat> reprogramming. Well, and sometimes you have to pay somebody to be a safe person for you. I mean, honestly, there's really no, there's no magic in therapy. I mean, I've had plenty of it. <laughs> We've had plenty of it um, as well. And really, it's a person who will help you <clears throat> put words to what's going on in your own head and heart and then connect some dot, help you connect some dots and then give you empathy. Yeah. I mean, I went through a trauma almost three years ago now that I've been in th therapy for, you know, um, for about two years of that, and the, my therapist has given me empathy with a fire hose. And for some reason, I've been able to receive it, and now I'm just like, where has this been all my life? Mm. And it, it's just listening and validating and experiencing compassion. And, I mean, empathy, God created us to need that. Empathy is a, it's another expression of love, right? We go back to what is love. But it, God created us to need it. Uh, there's, there's this book actually written by, it's, the guy's not even a believer, but he, it's called The Science of Love, where he actually, he actually, there's all these experiments and different things where they have proven that, not, they don't see it from, they just look at it from a, from a biological standpoint, of an evolutionary standpoint, which is dumb, but... Um, you know, because God created us with this. I mean, something as sim simple as in 1945, they had this, uh, these hospitals 
uh, were having all of these babies that they didn't have enough caretakers for. Yeah. But they were feeding them, changing their diapers, they had everything they need, but these babies were dying because they didn't have enough nurses that could actually hold the babies. God created us to need touch. Right, the failure to thrive. That, yeah, that skin on skin. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation is the greatest expression of what we're talking about here. Jesus didn't just come because he needed to die bodily for us. Yes, that's true. But he also comes so that we know we have a great high priest who, who can relate to us, that we can relate to because he's experienced everything that we have and yet's without sin. Yeah. All this is there if we were to just open our eyes. So many of us are just, have just been asleep to this stuff. And it's like when you start, when somebody starts pointing it out to you, you're looking and going, where's this, where's, there's a white Honda Civic right there. I mean, it's like I'm seeing this everywhere now. There's all these white Honda Civics everywhere. Yes. Well, there are, I mean, as you said, you had 18 pages of notes and we had to cut it down a little bit. But as you can see, I mean, we are just touching the surface of this. Yes. And um, there's so much more that we could be talking about. But one of the things that makes Saddleback Saddleback is we always want to point to kind of like, well, what might I do with this? Right. Um, you know, the, 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 do, the idea of doable discipleship, which is one of our values here. So what would, you, what would you both say that kind of you're inviting the people in this room, the people watching at our campuses or online, when are you kind of inviting them to think about or do? Like what, what might, as they, as they close their laptops or walk out of these rooms or the campus, like what's something they can do? What's the first step that they, that they might take? Hmm. Well, as you met mentioned earlier about being afraid, it's scary. Just lean into that hmm. and pray about a person or two people or three people that you can share the hurts, the wounds, the pain, and receive the empathy. It's, it's life-changing. It, it, because of my fears, it took me, I don't know how long till I would step out in faith and be vulnerable. Because I desired the deep connection. And we all do. Yeah, we're just afraid of it, and so we've just pushed it down. I think another, you mentioned it earlier, Rob, but I think we need to address it. A, a, a real practical first step is to go to Celebrate Recovery. Because you're gonna find people there <clears throat> that, have, that are in a similar mindset that you are. They're recognizing they don't have it all together. There's bro they have broken places. They're willing to talk about it and share it. I mean, 2 Corinthians 1, I love it, you know, that we have this God of all compassion who comforts us in our suffering so that we can comfort others with the same comfort that we have received from him. I mean, that's this whole aspect of bearing each other's burdens and, 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 and doing this. And we have to put ourselves in situations where we're going to be able to have a fighting chance at meeting some people that are kind of on the same journey. Um, there's way more people that are than you think than you think are. It's like we have this like code, you know. So, you know, I know maybe like they did like in the early church, they draw a fish in the sand and like, do you know what that is? <laughs> I don't know what our symbol is, but I'm just saying that you know they're there. Sometimes you have to pay somebody for it. Um, in in your outline uh, that you actually have, uh, there's a whole sheet. Uh, it's on <clears throat> the last page that gives you all these aspects of your identity in Christ. I would encourage you sometime this week to sit down during your quiet time and pull that list out and just start reading through those things. And then I'd encourage you to read them aloud. I did, we did this in an exercise with one of our groups where we had them split up into pairs and we had them read them to each other. It is powerful. Mm. And then uh, and that all comes out of a book that was written many years ago by a guy named uh, Neil Anderson. The book was Victory of the Darkness. He was a, the theology, he was a chairman of the theology department at Talbot years ago when I was doing my undergrad there. Um, <clears throat> but it's a powerful uh, example. Um, take Psalm 139 and make that part of your devotional life for, for the next week or two and just read through it over and over again and open yourself up to the Spirit, Lord, what do you want to say to me in this? Is there a word or a phrase that <clears throat> kind of jumps out at you uh, from that? And then just trust that you've asked God to reveal things to you so that when things come to your mind, just trust that that's God bringing it to your mind. Yes. <clears throat> And if it's stuff that you never would have come up on your own, it's usually God. Yes. And, and, and don't be afraid, right? Perfect love casts out fear. Yes. And, and I have that verse like every day. I have to, because fear is my thing. Fear is my thing. So I have to, I have to hit that scripture all the time. But man, how, how helpful it is to, to help me step 
away from those bushes and step out and you know not be ashamed anymore. Um, Beth's going to come up in a minute and just kind of uh, talk about some next steps because um, that's what we're about here at South Back. But Ken, would you pray for us? Yeah. Pray for the people who are watching online, just uh, that they might be encouraged to to take their next steps with this. Yeah, guys, thanks for those of you that are here and for you guys watching online. Uh, you know, we've we've touched on a lot of things tonight and. Really, that next step is, I, I think, honestly, the most basic thing that we can all do is just ask God for courage and to step into it. That threshold between bondage and freedom is vulnerability, and it takes courage to be vulnerable. And so I'm glad that we have, like you said earlier, that we have a place here where we don't have to be perfect, and we can take the masks off, and... We can find what God has for us. So let's take a minute and let's pray. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> you have secured so much for us in your love for us at the cross. So much more, Lord, than we ever realized. Not only have you atoned for our sin and paid that price, not only have you reconciled our relationship to the Father, the things that are true that come out of that are mind-blowing. That we are clothed in your righteousness. That we can boldly come into the presence of the Father with no fear, no shame, no guilt, no dread. Because you took all of the wrath of the Father upon yourself at the cross. There's nothing more to fear. Help us to embrace the truth about who you say we are. Lord, I pray for everybody that is hearing this and those that will even listen days and weeks after this, that they would experience your presence in a more profound way uh, than they ever have before. That they would realize that they are your sons and daughters. That they are one in whom Christ dwells. That they are a partaker of the divine nature. They are a co-heir with Christ. They are the beloved. They are part of the family of God. Lord, our eternity began at the moment of salvation. There is a whole new life in the kingdom that is available to us right here and right now. If we would only access it, just flip the switch. Lord, I pray that tonight would be the flip of the switch. That the enemy would no longer have any power using fear or shame or condemnation. Lord, that we would stand in the light, that we would fight back the darkness with the truth of your word, the truth of who you say we are, and the truth of who you are as our loving Heavenly Father, that we might embrace fully and experience more robustly who you are and who we are because of that. And Lord, I pray that, we would, that tonight would be the beginning of a movement. Lord, this even grassroots, that as, as we begin to take on more and more of the character of Christ as we begin to step into this profound reality of who we are in Christ right here, right now, that it would begin such a transformation process that people would see the profound difference and inquire as to what it is. And that in that, we might be able to share with them both the good news of the gospel, that in Christ there is forgiveness, but that also in Christ there is a filling and a power of the Spirit that will bring about a different quality of life than they ever dreamed possible. Lord, I want that. I want that for my friends here. I want that for our church. And Lord, for everyone who might hear this message. And so we pray that through the power of your spirit, that would become true. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. amen. Well, thank you, Ken and Susie, for joining us. You guys are such a gift to our community. And um, we really appreciate this conversation this evening. Um, and thanks to Rob for just creating space for our team to step into these conversations. Yeah. So this has been a gift for all of us. Yeah. yeah. So like Rob said, we, we like to not just talk about discipleship, but we like to give next steps. Um, and we call that doable discipleship. So for many of us hearing this for the first time, I just want to encourage you that maybe your first step is just recognizing that the number one tool to breaking through these spiritual growth barriers is this pursuit of emotionally healthy discipleship? And is this pursuit of living in community and creating space for disciplines and for habits in our lives? 
And so um, if you're like me, I've heard this, this is my third time of hearing this conversation because we talked through some of this two times with Ken leading up to this evening and there's still so much goodness that just sinks deep. And um, so I would encourage you as you leave from here, we have a couple next steps on some slides, but pray through Psalm 139, like Ken said, let that be your prayer these next few weeks. Um, Watch this again. It will continue to be available on saddleback.com slash conversations for the next few days. So watch it again. Let, let it sink in deep, okay? Um, like, like Rob said, and like Ken and Susan talked about, um, recovery is such an important part of, of all of our lives and of all of this, this process for emotionally healthy discipleship. So if you are here at Saddleback or you belong to another church, seek out a Celebrate Recovery group. Don't do life on your own. Okay, join a small group. Here is a church we're about to head into 40 days of prayer where we're going to talk about things like what does it look like to pray breakthrough prayers and what does it look like to, to continue to pray when God's not answering our prayers in the way we're expecting. So we're going to be talking about some of these things, some of these breakthrough things. Join a small group and have that conversation together with a few other people. Okay. From a spiritual maturity perspective, we continue this conversation that we call Doable Discipleship every week on a podcast called Doable Discipleship, hosted by pastors Doug and Jason. And so we talk about what does it look like to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Um, we also have retreats. Okay, tonight we talked about the value of just um, practicing these disciplines, pulling away for silence and solitude. Because it's in those moments that God transforms us. He uses scripture to transform us, to renew our mind. So join us for a retreat. We're in the process of building out a really robust retreat calendar for 2018. And we would love to walk alongside of you as you learn to experience silence and solitude. Or as you learn to experience prayer in a new way. And then... Last but not least, our team just launched a new um, maturity landing page. And so if you ever have questions for our team or if you ever have um, um, desires to participate in spiritual maturity at your campus or here at the Lake Forest campus, check out our page. This is where we keep all of our latest information up to date. In fact, we are already talking about what would it look like to continue this conversation with Ken and Susan in the future. So all of, all of that information will be on our maturity landing page. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're all around for some questions or conversation afterwards. Um, and we just really appreciate you being here. All right, you're dismissed. Thank you to our online.